All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bart Nijland and I work at uh, Gene Twisted Technologies. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, high quality assembly of a tetraploid rose that we have made using uh, uh, PacBio sequence data. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the people of uh, PacBio, of course, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to present this work in their uh, session. So I just want to spend one slide on uh, introducing uh, Gene Twister. Um, we're a small medium enterprise company uh, based in uh, Wageningen in the Netherlands. You could say the egg bio research uh, capital of the Netherlands. Um, we're a small company, so there's about 35 people working at Gene Twister. Uh, we just celebrated our 21st birthday in uh, December. Uh, and the research that we are doing is for five breeding companies, plant breeding companies, who are located all around the world. Um, so uh, the research that we are doing is um, uh, we are helping them to breed for more complex traits uh, by using the latest technologies in the field of uh, plant molecular breeding. Uh, there's two types of projects. Um, the, there's projects with a more applied research focus. Uh, so these are, yeah, um, uh, pr uh, for example, projects like uh, um, uh, Market Trade Association for Complex Traits, uh, the Novo Genome Assemblies, uh, or characterization of germplasm through resequencing. Uh, the other types of projects are the R&D projects, uh, as part of our R&D program, uh, in which we look at the latest tools and technologies and software uh, that can help the shareholders uh, to advance their breeding program. So uh, the work that I'm going to present is actually part of this uh, R&D program. Uh, so although most of the work that we are doing is for our five shareholders, um, we are open for all kinds of uh, other collaborations. Uh, so for that, you're welcome to visit our booth at 128. It's uh, at the <laughs> Dutch alley. You will recognize the orange carpet, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the, the project. Um, well, needless to say that rose is a very important uh, ornamental crop. Uh, I hope that many of you have ever uh, received a big bunch of roses for uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, but also, uh, it's uh, in 2018, it was the number one cut flower at the Royal Flora Holland, which is the uh, Dutch flower auction. Um, so genome-wise, it has a relatively small genome with uh, seven chromosomes, uh, a haploid genome size between 400 and 750. Uh, and the ploidy of the commercial material is between diploid and pentaploid, uh, with most of the material being tetraploid, and more specifically, a segmental allotetraploid, which means that part of the genome is behaving like an allotetraploid and parts of the genome is behaving like an uh, autotetraploid. So we got ourselves a real challenge here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, few, a few years ago, there were two papers in uh, Nature describing a, a genome assembly of uh, Rosa chinensis, uh, which was a double haploid variety, old blush. Um, and even though, yeah, uh, contiguity of this assembly was very good, um, and also, um, uh, what was I? Um, well, um, so uh, Shinansis, oh yeah, Shinansis is one of the ancestors of, uh, of uh, the commercial rose, Rosa hybrida. Um, yeah, it is a different variety and also because it's a double, a double haploid, so all the variation within this variety is, uh, is lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, um, uh, I don't need to explain too much on, uh, on why we need high quality genomes for breeding. Um, it gives you a good uh, insight of the, of the genome. Uh, what is the, the ploidy, what is the genome size, uh, the type of ploidy. Um, also, I want to point your attention to the, to the di diagram on the right. Is this working? Oh, yeah. um, so before we used to uh, make genome assemblies where we could, would collapse all the variation into a single haplodized sequence. Uh, and now um, we are moving more towards into uh, haplotype aware assemblies. So there's, we've seen these days a lot of uh, talks on that already. Um, such a haplodized uh, type of assembly um, for, uh, yeah, for a rose, uh, which is highly heterozygous and highly complex, um, not only does it not re represent all the variation in there, um, it's also due to the difference in all the alleles. It's quite challenging even to uh, to make uh, to collapse all the uh, all the alleles into one. So that's why that why there's a huge benefit of making a haplotype aware assembly uh, uh, of a species like this. Um, but for this uh, such a haplotype aware assembly with uh, with the, well 
uh, established technologies using either short reads or uh, long reads with a low accuracy. Uh, and this is pretty challenging and uh, they don't perform very well uh, in that. Um, so I'm just showing an example of uh, uh, where we mapped uh, Illumina reads of a, of a tetraploid rose variety to the uh, old blush reference, which was, uh, was already available. Um, you can see it maps reasonably well. Uh, you see a lot of variation, so a lot of difference between the two varieties. Um, but it's quite difficult to tell, well, which are the haplotypes. Uh, and also if we look in the region in the right, uh, oops, uh, this region we see, uh, we see a drop in coverage, but it's very hard to tell uh, what is going on. And this picture will come back uh, later in the presentation. So this is, uh, so, um, well, uh, the, the goal of our projects was to make a haplotype aware assembly of this, uh, of this tetraploid rose. Um, and I mentioned also already that existing technologies, they are quite, uh, well, they don't perform very well in, uh, in doing this. So that's why we were very happy when uh, uh, PacBio released a high five protocol, which uh, Jonas already uh, um, explained. So I don't need to go into detail in that. Um, due to the high accuracy of the reads, we thought this could really help us in, uh, in solving this challenge. So we did um, uh, DNA isolation of a, a leaf tissue of the Tetraploid rose variety. And yeah, for those of you who've worked with rose before, um, it's known to be a bit of notorious um, because of secondary metabolites. Um, but uh, yeah, after some uh, optimizations, we, uh, we got some very nice DNA. Um, in the fragment analyzer trace, you can see there's a DNA of about 43 KB in size. Um, and we proceeded to, uh, to this uh, HiFi smart library prep. Uh, and yeah, we did sharing using the Corvaris G-tubes and performed the HiFi library prep protocol. Um, and you can see that the final li library is about 14 and a half <laughs> KB in size. So um, sequencing was performed at our uh, collaboration partner in uh, Nijmegen at the uh, Radboud UMC, and they were uh, very helpful in this, uh, in this process because we were uh, dealing with uh, quite a strict timeline and we were very happy that they, uh, uh, they did the sequencing uh, uh, in such a short time frame. So they uh, sequenced four, uh, four smart cells on, uh, on SQL2 and the resulting data you can see in the, in the table in the, in the bottom. Uh, so we uh, obtained over two terabytes of uh, raw polymerase data out of these four smart cells and which is an average yield of um, uh, over 500 gigs per, uh, per smart cell. So uh, Jonas was mentioning uh, that, uh, that there's people getting over half a terabyte of data. So we were some of the lucky few. So we're very happy with that. Um, after consensus calling, we uh, had in total 142 gigs of, uh, of data with, a, with an N50 length of uh, 14 and a half KB, which is to be expected from the uh, insert size of the library. Um, and uh, the average yield per smart cell was about 35 and a half gigs, uh, which based on the estimated genome size is uh, 89X coverage per haplotypes, which should be more than sufficient for uh, for the Novo assembly. So what we tested is the, um, uh, the quality of the, of the data versus the, the read length, because you can imagine that the shorter inserts, they get more passes through the molecule, uh, so they get higher quality. Um, and whereas the, yeah, the bigger molecules, they get fewer passes and the quality is lower. So this is also what we can nicely see in this graph. Um, in black, I should mention, is the distribution of the, of the reads that we have. And you can see, for example, at uh, 20 KB, we still have 50% uh, of the reads who are over Q30, and the other 50% is over uh, Q20. So this also gives you uh, some idea of uh, how, uh, yeah, how insert sizes can even be uh, uh, pushed further. So we did um, uh, Kamer analysis, basically to uh, investigate the heterozygosity of this, uh, of this sample. And uh, also, yeah, due to the high accuracy of the reads, we can nicely see four distinct, uh, distinct peaks, which you would expect in a, in a heterozygous uh, tetraploid sample. So we were uh, uh, very happy to see this. So then again, I'm coming back to the, to the mapping picture, which I uh, uh, showed before with the uh, Illumina reads. So we have the same, uh, same region uh, on top. 
Uh, and now if we map the uh, HiFi reads, uh, we can nicely see that we uh, can already distinguish four haplotypes when, uh, when mapping the reads. And also uh, on the right, where before in the Illumina reads it was difficult to see what, what was going on there, uh, the drop in coverage is actually because there's uh, deletions in three of the four, uh, four alleles. Um, of course, I should point out that this is uh, a feature where uh, IGV allows you to uh, cluster the reads, uh, which is available for long reads and not for short reads. So I guess if you could do it for the Illumina reads, it might look a bit, little bit better as well. But um, at least this is, uh, this is very promising so far. But um, it's not everywhere. Uh, it doesn't look as nice as, uh, as this. Um, so if we look into other regions of the genome, uh, we map the reads to the, uh, to the reference, and we see that especially in the coding regions, uh, well, the mapping is, uh, is quite good. Um, but there's a lot of variation, so all the different colors are the, uh, are the SNPs. So there's a lot of variation between the diploid variety and the, uh, and the tetraploid variety that we're using. Um, and even more in the intergenic regions, there's, yeah, uh, there's hardly any mapping, which means that they are, uh, they are so different, uh, which is why we need a de novo assembly. So we performed a, a de novo assembly of these, uh, of these data using uh, Falcon and Canoe. And uh, when, when looking at these uh, assembly sizes, uh, keep in mind that, yeah, um, uh, the total genomic content is uh, 1600 megabytes based on flow cytometry, which is probably uh, four subgenomes of 400 megabytes. Uh, also based on camera analysis, we estimated the haploid genome size at uh, 350 megabytes. Um, so uh, since we're going for haplotype aware, um, yeah, we're, we're looking at an assembly size or we're aiming for an assembly size between 1400 and 1600 megabytes. So that's something to keep in mind when, uh, when looking at these numbers. Um, so we performed the assembly such that the uh, overlap in the, um, or the identity of the overlaps of the reads should be very high. And this, is, uh, this can be done because we have such high accuracy data, but also um, it will help to separate out the different, uh, different haplotypes. So you can see in the, in the column that we used uh, over 99%. Um, for Canoe, actually, we used a, a version which was just released in, uh, in December, um, which is uh, tuned to work better on, uh, on high fire reads. So we were very happy that uh, that, that was uh, recently released, uh, just in time for our uh, project. And uh, I guess that uh, Saga is going to might, might be talking about this in, uh, on Wednesday as well in the, in the meeting. Um, so well, I mentioned already the assembly sizes are, are looking in the range where we're, what we're looking for. Also, if we look at the Busco scores, the assemblies are, uh, are highly complete. Um, and normally you would want to have these duplicate rates to have them as low as possible. But again, since we are going for haplotype aware, you would also expect that the uh, Busco genes are in here multiple times. So this is actually, uh, actually a good thing. Um, and last, and most importantly, we were very happy that with the uh, canoe assembly uh, that we, we passed the magic uh, 10 megabase uh, and 50 mark. So we were, uh, yeah, uh, which suggests that we have haplotype aware chromosome arms in our assembly. So uh, we're, uh, we're very happy with that. And then, of course, yeah, we wanted to see, well, to get a better idea what is actually in this assembly. So we aligned it to the, uh, to the dip, uh, double haploid old blush reference. And uh, you can see in the picture that there's a lot of double, triple, and uh, quadruple lines even, suggesting the, the different haplotypes. And if we uh, uh, zoom in to the, oops, uh, to the picture on the right, we see regions where we have uh, four different haplotypes. Um, and even the, the top haplotype has an, uh, has an inversion, which uh, probably yeah, we wouldn't have found by any other, uh, any other approaches. So we were uh, very happy with these uh, results. Then uh, the last thing uh, that, we, uh, that we did the, uh, um, to, uh, to estimate how well the haplotypes were separated is that um, we used coverage analysis. So I'll just explain what the, what the reasoning is uh, behind that. Uh, so in the top, left corner, these, these are supposed to be chromosomes, so, well, forgive my drawings, but uh, uh, let's say that uh, in, a, 
in an assembly where all the haplotypes or all the alleles are collapsed, you would get a certain coverage. In this case, it's, yeah, let's say, coverage one. Whereas uh, if you would be able to separate out all the haplotypes completely into four different haplotypes, then uh, the coverage would be decreased by a factor four. So with that, um, we, yeah, we tried to quantify how well, the, how well we were able to sep separate the haplotypes. Uh, so we mapped um, the high fi reads against both the uh, old blush reference, that's the red line, as well as the, uh, the high fi assembly, which is the blue line. And you can see in the, um, uh, in the red line, you see quite a, quite a distribution across the different coverages. Uh, whereas in the, uh, the high fi assembly, the new high fi assembly that we made, it, we see a strong in increase at the, um, what we think is the, yeah, uh, the different separated haplotypes. Um, so which means that, uh, that our assembly is uh, well, very much improved and uh, uh, that we were able to separate many of the haplotypes. Still we see a small peak at, uh, let's say, uh, uh, two-fourth. Um, so uh, this can still be, uh, can still be improved. Uh, this might be due to the segmental allotetraploidy that some of the alleles are very similar and they were difficult to separate. Uh, for that, yeah, we need probably longer range information, either longer reads or different types of data like BioNano or HiC. Uh, so there's still uh, uh, possibilities to improve upon that. So, um, well, we see that um, this opens up a lot of uh, new opportunities for, uh, for complex genome assembly. So we managed to uh, assemble a heterozygous and a polyploid genome. Uh, in addition, for this procedure, we don't need any ultra high molecular weight DNA, which we uh, uh, did for a lot of other uh, long read sequencing. Um, the sequence coverage, which is required uh, in the assembly is, uh, is lower uh, because of the high accuracy and also the, the computation of the assemblies is, uh, is much less. Uh, but most importantly, we're getting a, a, a better a representation, a better overview of the, of the genomic content uh, in the assembly. So in, uh, in summary, um, we were able to make a, a hapl haplotype-aware assembly of, uh, of a complex polyploid genome using uh, high fi reads. And uh, this provides a very valuable tool for, uh, for molecular uh, breeding efforts in, uh, in rows. Uh, however, there's still some work to be done. Uh, first of all, we want to validate the haplotypes, uh, for example, by using BioNano or HiC data. Uh, also, we want to scaffold the uh, assembly further using HiC. So we're already uh, in a collaboration with Phase Genom Genomics to generate the HiC data. So the data has been generated and we're now working on the, uh, on the assemblies. Um, also, we're planning to use a tool called AllHIC all or AllHIC, uh, which is, uh, can be used to scaffold polyploid genomes using uh, uh, HIC data. So there's a very nice paper on, uh, on sugarcane on that. Um, and lastly, we, uh, we might also try to, uh, to uh, scaffold the assembly further using uh, Oxford Nanopore data. So with that, that brings me to the, to the last slide, and I want to uh, thank a few people, uh, specifically my, uh, my colleagues at Gene Twister, and uh, specifically uh, Henry van der Geest, who uh, did a lot of the, uh, or did all of the bioinformatics work, and uh, really made this uh, project into a success. Um, and Mark de Heer, who made uh, all these uh, uh, smart libraries who were sequencing so well, uh, and that performed so well in SQL 2. Um, also, uh, Doom and Orange uh, for providing the plant material that was used. Um, also PacBio, of course, for uh, setting up the collaboration with uh, Radboud UMC in Nijmegen and also uh, providing support in, uh, in the whole process. And of course, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to present this work. Um, and last, also uh, yeah, uh, Radboud UMC for uh, uh, doing the sequencing in uh, such a short time frame, such that, we, uh, that I could present this work here. So. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for listening and, uh, well, I'd be happy to take any questions later. So. <laughs>